Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and with me today is a man who was also thrown out of a train in his pajamas. It's true, I was, twice. But you survived. It's important to know, because you're here. Oh, I I guess I did then. Plot hole. I am the Adam Glass, and this week we are talking about Sherrod. 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 1963. Stanley Donnan film. Uh, Stanley Donnan, also the director of one of my favorite movies, uh, possibly my favorite movie of all time, the original Bedazzled, and, and also Singing yes, in the Rain. my favorite movie. Yes. So, this man yes. has won our hearts. He has, he and, has. And does so in this movie, too, because I really enjoyed this one as well. Yes, this movie is a, uh, a thriller. A uh, bit of a comedic thriller, but not a parody uh, of thrillers, really. Um, it is often referred to as the best Hitchcock movie that Hitchcock never made, uh, which is a quote I find a lot, but no one seems <laughs> to, know to who be said able it. to cite yeah. who said I it. It's, I think it may not be true. Like I don't know that anybody it, well, ever no, said it's, it. It's no, 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 it's, it's definitely certainly true, true about the film. It may not be. What I'm saying is yes. I'm not sure that anybody ever said it, if it's just maybe one of those things that just sort of entered the zeitgeist about it, because yes. Yes. it's it's so obviously reads like a Hitchcock film, but is better than them. Yeah. In the sense... Well, especially at the time. This was made in 1963, which is the same year that Alfred Hitchcock made The Birds, and The Birds is the last of Hitchcock's good movies. Um... <laughs> Everything he made after 1963 was terrible. The Birds isn't great. Um, it's certainly up there, and I understand why it's uh, why it's venerated. But there are better Hitchcock movies than The Birds. But everything Hitchcock made after this uh, was just bad. Well, and, and, <laughs> and like you know, my my exposure to Hitchcock is I don't think as broad as yours. But, like, am uh-huh. I compared to the ones we've watched in the Criterion Collection specifically? This does, follows the Hitchcock formula, but does a much better job of it than Hitchcock does in those movies that we have watched. I think you're probably right there. Though both of the both of the Hitchcock movies we watched previously, The Lady Vanishes and last week we talked about uh, 39 Steps, both of those films are very early Hitchcock. So yeah, I know. it's understandable that they're still half-formed as far as Hitchcock... Uh, Hitchcock stuff goes. But they do... every The elements of Hitchcock movies, the elements that make Hitchcock movies famous, are there in both of those movies. And they're also there in this movie. So Stanley Donnan does a very good job of uh, of channeling Hitchcock as far as that goes. Well, and when you consider um, I think, his... I mean, like, I don't... we I really should have actually looked this up. Like, you know, we named a few movies that he had made before, or that he made also... But uh-huh. I, does he have a lot of thrillers in his pedigree? I don't think so. Like, I th- he has a lot of. I see. He has a lot of comedies in his. Yeah, his I see. Like pedigree. a lot of musicals on this list. Yes, yeah, and a lot of musical. He's also he's also a choreographer, so he does a lot. Right, and so what I'm saying That's is, in that is. weird way, like for somebody who he, if we assume that Hitchcock, this is the ones we've seen are early Hitchcock, but he has, this is kind of what he does. And the fact that this is yeah. not what this guy does, but he does this thing really, really well this one time. It's yeah. really impressive. No, it's super impressive. Donnan, Donnan's a very impressive director. Because this is an amazing um, movie. Yeah, this and, and the direct like the directing on uh Bedazzled isn't necessarily the best part of that and Bedazzled. It's not it's not like a pinnacle of directorship, uh, so much as it's just a really funny movie that I love. Um, but, you know, Singing in the Rain is... Yes. Is gorgeous. Directed. Yes. Great. Um, and, and the directing on this is really... Yeah, really I mean, this movie too. is really solid. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's really weird to come off of 39 Steps into <laughs> this. Because when you're watching it, yeah. you're like, wow, this is a... Like, it was actually pretty hard for me not to think of this as a Hitchcock movie when I was watching it. I was like, I was yeah. like man, Hitchcock really knocked him out of the park this time. Like, yeah, it hits oh, a lot. No, a didn't. lot of the notes it needs yeah. to hit to be to be a Hitchcock esque film, and 
Yeah. The only the only difference and is that, that our female uh, character is actually human. Well, yeah, but still her ultimate goal is to get well, married to Cary Grant. No, but that's the thing, though. In the other movies that we have watched that are the, the, the true Hitchcock films, yeah. we, the women are not people until they get married. She yes. is happy that they're going to get married. Yeah. But she also kind of gives she, them a jab well, it, at the very end about that very scenario. Yeah. Yeah, it we'll helps kids, that she names. is. Whatever. Yes, it helps that she is. Uh, she is the aggressor in this relationship. Well, that, yeah, I mean that's. What, yeah, I mean, and that's actually something Cary Grant insisted on, uh, because Cary Grant was fifty nine when this was filmed, and Audrey Hepburn was thirty four, um, and and she's Audrey Hepburn, so she looks like she's twenty two right, until right. she's fifty, um, but uh, but yeah, he insisted that it would not. Not be good if he 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 looked like a lech. Yeah, and I agree. One. It's a real smart yeah. thing because, like, yeah. her as the one chasing him really paints her as a really pretty solid character. Yeah. I like yeah. her. She's definitely she's definitely a stronger female character than anything we've seen. Oh, and that's what I'm saying is like if we have to compare apples to apples here, yeah. she is. About a bajillion times stronger and more human and more womanly than any of the Hitchcock yeah. main female characters we've encountered so far. Yeah, and the fact that at one point she does stop trusting uh, Cary Grant's character, right. who I, I mean, normally when I'm talking about a movie, I'd refer to the character by name, but I can't decide which name to call Cary Grant's yeah, character. Yeah, it's so. really, let's stick with Cary Grant's character, because it's actually... Yes. Because we find out his name, but by the time we find yeah. out his true name, it's almost irrelevant. It's it's, it's the final scene. It's Crookshanks, right. and it's a horrible the name. last thing we learn. <laughs> it's, it's also yeah. a horrible name. Uh, Which I love. I love her line when she learns that it, that his name is Crookshanks. She says, "Oh, I probably deserve that one. <laughs> or, I probably deserve to have that one." <laughs> but yeah, this uh, yeah this if Hitchcock had made this movie, this would be Hitchcock's best movie. Uh, yes. So this isn't just the best Hitchcock movie not filmed, not made by Hitchcock. Um, this, this I really think is it, it's probably it takes yes. everything that Hitchcock was doing and makes a better movie out of its pieces. Well, and I think in a weird way, Hitchcock was really good at cooking those things up, but actually yeah. not that great at putting them all into a great movie. Whereas this one liberally takes from that and just makes a more solid film out of it. Yeah, and like I think that's a big key thing is that like people have been borrowing from Hitchcock forever, and there's been a lot of movies that borrowed from him that actually do a better job of using his stuff than yeah. he did, which is weird. But I mean, I don't know. Not to like get into too much Hitchcock talk, part two. Yes. Let's talk Hitchcock, the the, the podcast. Um, yes. but no, I'm just saying that like this, yeah, this movie is excellently executed and like really like you really feel like you're why you like I was like I really kept going man like I can't believe they showed us two Hitchcock films in a row like no they didn't show me two Hitchcock films in a row they showed me a Hitchcock film and then showed me like what happens if you distill Hitchcock down and then make you know add Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant and a pretty good set of like pretty good directing you know it's, I don't know, it's just, it's great. It's probably one of the best movies that, like, it's it's not 400 Blows, but it's definitely one of my favorite movies that we've watched. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah it's, 400 Blows I think we both loved because of how real it felt. And this right. movie certainly doesn't feel no, real. No, no, but <laughs> it does feel a little bit like Singing in the Rain in a really weird way. It yeah. has that yeah. sort of surreal element to it. We're like it, it, we're in this universe, but this universe can't really exist. It, it's a movie that knows it's a movie. Yes. I think is is a great way to describe seeing the rain. And this movie gets it doesn't necessarily wink at the audience uh, in knowing that it's a film. It certainly doesn't break the fourth wall in knowing that it's a film. But it's a movie that embraces its moviness to a certain extent, 
not to do weird things, not to do out there things. Right, right. We don't break the fourth to... wall, but we do yeah. also not follow the nature of reality exactly. Yeah. And and, yeah. and no, I, I think it's... And I love how, like, I talked about this during 39 Steps, how I knew exactly what was going to happen, pretty much. Yeah. This one, I had no idea. Well, this I mentioned last time that one of the one of the facts that I memorize all the time uh, affected how I viewed this movie. Uh, and you know, normally I don't care about spoilers at all, but as the third act in this movie started, and we were really sold that Cary Grant's character might actually be the bad guy, mm. and Audrey Hepburn was certainly worried that Cary Grant was the bad guy. Um, and, you know, we're still, until she makes the call to the embassy and we find out that, uh, Walter Matthau is not who he claimed he was, uh, and is in fact Dial, the, the Dial we thought (laughs) we were told was dead. Um, until we find that out, that whole third act, we're pretty sure Cary Grant's going to kill her. Um, but in the back of my head, I thought... Wait a minute, Cary Grant never played a villain. Yeah, well, you know, I that didn't bother me at all. You yeah. know how, like... Well, it's just the fact that I knew that kind of undermined... Uh, undermined... Undermound the... Uh, oh my god, please don't do act. that. So yeah, that... Not to say that that ruined anything for me, it's just... You know, it, it would have been more effective watching it without that knowledge. Without thinking Cary, Cary Grant's not a bad guy. You know, and I can imagine viewing this, uh, you know, with knowledge of Cary Grant's career, because this was like the third to last movie he made. Um, so viewing this with knowledge of Cary Grant's career in 63, um, you would think, oh, this is, this is a really dramatic change for Cary Grant, playing playing such an obvious bad guy murderer. Um, and then, boom, it's not. And that's, you know, that's, that's a good twist. That's a really good twist to take a, to take an actor established as something to sell him as that something and then slowly introduce. Well, and then uh, continue him to, to sell him as that right up till very close to the end. Like we see yeah, a good I mean, side of him throughout it, but then we also are led down the rosy path to believe that he is lying again. Yeah. And like, it's really yeah. because he lies so frequently we're like, oh, he really could be lying again. There's, there's no yeah. rule that says he's not. Um, and but I, I love it. I mean, because like, yeah, no, you say, well, Cary Grant never played a villain, but at the same time, that never entered my mind. And I don't think, yeah, that, uh, like, because also, even if you assume that Cary Grant is not the bad guy, we still don't know what the hell is going on. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like assuming yeah. that he is the good guy, we still don't know what's going because we don't realize the bad guy is a bad guy. Because we're lulled in by the same piece of evidence that she's lulled in by. He's at the embassy. She yeah. comes in and she talks to him in the embassy and he looks like he owns the place, which I guess makes him a really good con man. I mean, that's exactly what it's supposed to be all about, right? In Yeah. Uh but you believe that even us as the audience believe that he is also a member of the government, which makes that up until we find out that he is not makes things crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that leads us only one possible conclusion, which is Cary Grant is a liar and is actually a bad guy. Which is yeah. more- we know he's a liar the entire time. Right. We just don't know that he's, <laughs> we you know he's got the we know even even when we when we find out about the first lie we know at least that he's a thief. Right. And as we go about and learn that he might be a murderer as well. Yeah. We- right. And then and and none, and some of the the roles he steps into are more sympathetic than others, but then like in the end we are still we have to go okay well. Cary Grant's obviously the man... Well, Cary Grant's character is obviously the man who killed these people. And then you get a little suspicious. You're like, but that doesn't seem right. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we we have the same evidence that she has. And it does a very good job of 
well, yeah. fooling yeah. us. It's we're, great. I love it. She's she's very much the point of view character in this, and, and as the main character, she should be. Um, but but the audience gets the same confusion and distrust when she gets confusion and distrust. Which is really hard to do in storytelling. Yeah. Like, it's really yeah. hard to it's confuse very... your audience as much as your main character without making them want to throw yeah. the computer out the window. Yes. Yes, without completely disconnecting from them. To, to keep them involved uh, through that character's confusion while feeling everything. No, only knowing what the character knows. You know, it's very, it's very well done. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's very few instances in this movie where we don't, where we don't know what she knows. Um, we see the guy murdered before the opening credits. And we I later missed. found out that that was her. Yeah, we, we later found out that that was her husband. Yeah. Um, so you know, when she's talking about getting a divorce, it's it's interesting foreshadowing when she gets back to Paris and find out that he was the guy who was thrown off the train. Um, Assuming you actually, so you know, knowing. Him. Yeah, knowing that there was a murder prior to meeting her, I guess, is one point where we know something she doesn't know. But we don't know that that's her husband. We're just shown. And in fact, we don't even need to be shown that. You know? And then that's no, probably I, why because you and I, I both kind of forgot that yeah. it happened. Because it's a pre credit sequence, and it doesn't affect the storyline. You know? And not knowing that we saw him being thrown from the train. I guess the only, the only thing that certifies... Um, is that we won't, you know, she, she talks at some point about the, uh, the puppet show and that the husband's not really dead. Punch and Punch and Judy and Punch isn't really dead. He's just playing a joke on her. And there is a point where that could be foreshadowing to suggest that her husband's not really dead. Right. Uh, yeah. I kind um, of read and, it that way myself as well. And she immediately, she immediately says, but that's not true. I know he's really dead. You know, because she saw the body. Right, right. And, and we, we saw the murder. We didn't see the body, but we saw her and we saw the murder, theoretically, although I yeah. just did. Um, <laughs> yeah. But either way, yeah. Like, you kind of think, well, maybe he's not dead. But then, but then we also see the yeah. reaction of the guys who come in to check. And then we know that he is dead. Yes. Like, at that point, yes. which is later than the show, right? No, 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 that's no, before no. The, the show. The funeral is, is way before Right, okay, the yeah, and show. so I'm getting my timelines confused. But we, by that yeah. point, we know he is dead, too. Yeah, we're as convinced as he's dead that anyone, yeah. as anyone else in the movie. You know, James Coburn's character walks in and uh, puts a mirror in front of his nose. And then, then, then the sure other guy breathing. stabs him with a needle yeah. in the hand. Yeah, the next guy comes in and stabs him with a needle in the hand. We, we yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, great moments of comedy there. Uh, and I love James Coburn. I really do. I love I, lo- I love everyone. In no, this so cast. do I. And um, all the bad guys are, they, yeah, they're all great. The bad guy Kennedy is the the handless bad guy. I can't remember his first name. Oh, I um, don't. But he's a great character actor. And he's uh, Walter so Matthau. Good. Well, and yeah, there's Walter Matthau. Yeah. And and Walter Matthau. I I love. This is like the earliest Walter Matthau I've seen. And I think he's like forty, maybe forty two in this movie. Um. He was born in 1920, and this came out in 63, so he's, he's around 42, 43. And uh, he, uh, he's just, he's so Walter Matthau, whenever, I, however old he is. It's like, <laughs> he's got that old man voice. Yeah, I kind of wish I could <laughs> even yeah. see him younger than that. I want to see him like... I'm, I'm sure, that, I know there's movies he was in before this, um, so it'd be, be interesting to investigate. At um, what point he turned into Walter Matthau? <laughs> yes, <laughs> He accepted that mantle and just became, <laughs> became the Walter Matthau. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's, you know, this is, despite being a movie where four people get murdered, <laughs> um, it's a very light movie and it's very, it's not, you know, we've seen, yes. we've seen other, obviously we've seen a lot of movies that are comedies where people get killed. Yes. Um, and, and. You know, Hudson Hawk is a comedy <laughs> <word>. <laughs> Because we need to make sure we mention it in as many episodes yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yes, that we is We have true. to mention Hudson Hawk. Um, and, and it's always, you know, I talk about it like there's some disconnect between comedy and murder. But there's not. not Certainly not in American cinema and not, not in the tradition of uh, anything ever. Um, well, but it always depends, know. right, on like how you know the characters that get murdered, right? Like we don't yeah, know yeah. the husband, so we don't care. He is irrelevant. He is just how we start the story. Um, and then the men, who, the other men who die, we don't like them. 
We actually do like yeah. them because they're actually pretty fascinating characters. But well, yeah, they're they're great. People. But like, uh, like they are bad guys, so it's kind of also yeah. relevant. Like nobody, nobody good look. dies, and that's an important element. Yeah, and the movie, like, the movie sells like, shot and like them, you know, at some point in the story <laughs> or something. And which point win. we would be like oh, Walter right. Matthau doesn't win, which is good. Um, but yeah, uh, the movie says. Plays very well to sell the distrust among the thieves. Um, obviously, you know, even as Cary Grant's wooing her, um, in as much as he tries to woo her, which isn't very much, but uh, or allowing himself to be wooed. I, well, yeah, <laughs> uh, they're out. They're out to dinner, but the other guys are still sneaking up on her and threatening well, her. And, but the goal, his goal, is not like so. It's so convoluted when you take the whole movie in, in yeah, as a total. But at the time when he first introduces himself to her. We know we don't know, so it just seems like he's just a dude who hanging out at this place, right? Um, and then yeah. later when he comes, you're when she's being attacked by other people. I know that I am personally suspicious of him because there's already all these other bad guys who have kind of harassed her a little bit. And they're like, oh yeah, because you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well. No way that, like, random dude who comes to help is a good guy. Right? He's just got to be yeah. part of the team. But then we find out from the inspector that there's only three of them. And we meet all three yeah. of them. And then, oh, man. <laughs> this movie really, really, like, twists you about for a while. It does yeah. a really good job. Yeah. Because then, well, and then, you know, that's, then he that's... goes and talks to them. And we find out that he's doing what I you originally suspected he might be doing, which is... Uh, you know, trying to lull her into giving up the location. But then if you take it into the context of knowing the ending, yes, it's all very, very clever of him. Yes. He's just trying to sell it to the other guys right. more than necessarily himself, which is, you know, why despite being a thief, he would, uh, you know, obviously, obviously we characters are complicated. Humans are complicated. And a guy who makes a living stealing, uh, could still not want a woman 25 years younger than him to fall in love with him. Right. Um, even if it is Audrey Hepburn. Uh, Which but, you maybe know, actually it, makes him unbelievable. <laughs> yes. But I don't think, I don't think that it obviously makes more sense in a, in a uh, traditional morality sense if he's ultimately the good guy. Uh, right, right. That, to, yeah, uh, well, that's true. But trying to put off her advances. Um, but also, if he's just there for him. a job, and you know, because if he is actually a thief, then yeah. you know, it makes sense that he might not want to get emotionally involved in the person he's about to rob. Things like that, yeah. you know, it's comp- yeah. They do a very good job of making the characters very complex. Yeah, yeah, and and it's a movie where the characters could be a lot less complex. Yes, they could. Um, it could be this movie yeah. could be a lot simpler, especially yeah. from an acting standpoint, than it is. And, you know, the rest of the bad guys aren't necessarily fully rounded no, out. Uh, James Coburn characters. But they're not really... He plays a role, but... But they're not super flat. Either. No, they're not. And they're interesting in their own right. You, I like them. Like, I find them yeah. fascinating. Like... Yeah. And each one of them is bad in his own unique way, which makes them kind of interesting. Yes. Um, yeah, of course they're not well-rounded out, but it, we also only have, like, what, an hour and a half? Yeah. So if we're going to yeah, make Audrey yeah. Hepburn, Cary Grant, and Walter in any, Matthau interesting. In any piece of media, in any piece of media, not everyone gets to be around. Yeah, not character. everybody gets to be three-dimensional in an hour and a yeah. half. Or yeah. two hours or whatever this movie um, is. <laughs> There's so many great lines I keep thinking of and great moments of the comedy. Uh, you know, Cary Grant and the orange uh, in, the, in that scene uh, at the nightclub. And why is that even in happening at a nightclub? It's like a youth group game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Passing but it's really funny anyway. Net. But it, it, like, yeah, I always, I just felt uncomfortable when I was in church youth group settings and that game came up. Yeah. Cause it's, I've it's, never played that game. The only closest thing I have seen that game played. The only thing I've seen. Oh, go ahead. I've seen that, not necessarily church group, but, but even like, uh, like, like young, uh, like junior high team building things, and you know this this really sells it as as the sexualness that it's meant to be 
Uh, right, much, yeah, m- like much more than kids playing that has ever, and it's always made me slightly well, right, uncomfortable because, because there's I've a, seen this that. game and games like it are ex- very sexual, like yeah. which is weird. Concerned, yeah, they are usually found in junior high school related activities. Um, mm-hmm. The closest one I've ever seen to that, I've never seen this game played, but like uh, in Japan, they play one with you know you know Pocky, right? The yeah, well they they um they have to put pass it from person to person. Okay. Using only their mouths. Yeah. Okay. And, like, as you can imagine, that's very... It has that same element yeah. to it. Yeah. So. Um, see, I also really love her line uh, when she first meets Cary Grant at the resort. And she says, you know, I know so many people already. I couldn't <laughs> yeah, possibly yeah. fit you in until someone dies. And then, and then the next thing dies. we find out about her is that her husband's dead. <laughs> yeah, there's some... Her lines are great. She's really very um, pretty funny. There are some times where they don't, the jokes don't click with me that well. But yeah, like did you mentioned the chin thing already, right? Earlier in the podcast, yeah. I couldn't remember if that was before. Oh the, no, 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 no. The the uh, the dimples. Yeah. No, we talked about that before. That's one of my one of my favorite lines as well. Um, was uh, when she's uh, she's feeling Cary Grant's face. And she feels his dimples, and she says, "How do you even shave yeah, in that?" Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, um, and no, and there's some things he says too. I, I can't remember what he says when he's getting on the elevator, but he makes some comment that made me laugh about the space <laughs> available in like the entrance to the elevator, and how yeah. close they had to uh, get. And there's just like, there's a yeah. lot of good, and then there's just like some pretty funny moments that are not actually jokes, like um, when he's like. Somehow, like, when she's crouched in the phone booth making the phone call to the embassy, I found that really funny. Like, even yeah, though we're supposed even, to be Even intense, though it's supposed yeah, to be a tense moment. Like, the way yeah. she's talking on the phone just made me laugh. Like, I was like, this yeah. is really funny. And I don't... Well, it's, I mean, the the response of the... Uh, of the right, the yeah, yeah. On the yeah, other yeah. end is, is, you know, is, just speak up, just be helped, and whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of great moments. And, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit in the last movie because the I said the main character, 39 Steps, could be played by Cary Grant. Cary Grant, you know, he's obviously this this pinnacle of, of manhood in ways. But he's not he's not John Wayne. No, he's he not actually just... always reads as every man to me. And I think to most people, yeah. right? Like, I mean... <laughs> Even though he's more attractive than, than your average every no, man. Yeah, but, but that's <laughs> the nature of movies, right? Like... Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, like, my complaint in the previous movie about how awesome this guy is. Well, that's because he's the hero yeah. of the movie, right? Well, you can't yeah. have an ugly everyman character because then nobody will watch the movie. Yeah. So Cary Grant, Cary Grant is, you know, he's amicable. He's funny. He's, you know, he's bashful in a way uh, at some points. Well, and, and it actually really helps his character that he is, in, in that situation, not just helping Audrey Hepburn's character, but also helping his character... In the, uh, she's the one going after him. Is that yeah. like it makes him even more seem like a very down, even though we, he's lying and being not trustworthy, he is also yes. very down to earth feeling. Yes. Because he's not like trying to charm her pants off. And yeah. I'm really glad that he's not. So there's there's some weird things about this movie though that really struck me and, and kind of pulled me out okay. about it is uh, I don't know if it was just my copy, uh, but the color I, it seemed like it was colorized and it was shot in Technicolor. I know that as a fact. No, it's on the so I don't know why it seemed like it was. Um, I don't know why it seemed like it, it was did colorized, seem colorized and, yeah. to me as well. There's some other Technicolor stuff that that seems almost colorized like that. Um, but, but I suppose that has I to don't do know with it, the cinematography, right? Like, I mean, I suppose you can make yeah. your colors deep enough. You can saturate your colors enough. Because, yeah. I mean, that's the hallmark of colorization, right? Is that, like, the colors are more often than not un- unnaturally bright. Uh, like, yes. I mean, people's skin is unnaturally tan. People's clothes are unnaturally yeah. bright. There were a lot of points in this movie where it seemed like, at least... In my viewing, and I watched it on Netflix, and maybe this is just what it was, um, 
where the the grays of the background, like everything in the background, was gray. Like um, you know, and that may have been your like because my backgrounds yeah. were heavily muted, but more were yeah. blue. Maybe, they were in the maybe. blue uh, spectrum like, for me most of the time. There's a scene where they're standing by the river in front of a wall and a tree, and oh, the whole thing seemed gray. Okay. The scene where Cary Grant is jumping across the windows, where we first find out that he's in cahoots with the bad guys, mm-hmm. uh, before he gets there, that whole building seemed gray. Huh. Um, like, I didn't... And, yeah, they didn't read as gray to me. They, it seemed... Yeah. To, to me, and I think this is maybe my viewing, maybe it was your TV... Honestly, maybe because if your maybe. TV's not set up correctly, you can get some really weird colors out of it. Um, maybe. Because on what I would say is that mine, for me, it actually like the colors of the people and the main objects read as too bright, but okay, the background didn't read as gray. It just read as heavily muted, which means to to me, read as like a style choice. Like we're going to make our whatever's important in the scene heavily. Yeah. Like stand I guess that, that's 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 probably true. I, I, you're probably right there. You know, um, there was one scene where that kind of affected things, though, where it doesn't seem like what you're saying might be. Um, and that's where uh, where the one-handed criminal um, again, he's played by Kennedy, but I can't remember his actual name. Skokie, or something yeah, like that. Scobie, I think. Scobie, yeah, Scobie. Scobie and Cary Grant are on the roof, and there's the neon sign. And their faces are both lit with a little bit of uh, a bluish, I think, from the neon. Um, but their hands are black and white around the edge of the screen. And, you know, it, it could just be the lighting and my t- and combined with my TV. But that I really think it, it might be, because I don't remember, yeah. I don't remember that exactly. Okay. I remember that the colors of that scene being heavily muted. But yeah. I do not remember it being black and white. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right, and maybe uh, maybe it had sort of a tint to it that I just wasn't seeing. Maybe my eyes are bad. I don't know. Anyway, um, I did say that perhaps there might be a reason for that on the Netflix transfer, and that uh, it's interesting to know. I think that this movie is actually in the public domain. Uh, it was made in 1963, and prior to changes in copyright law, I think it was 78. Um, if you did not put a copyright notice on your work, uh, it's not well, copyright. Well, it seems like apparently from when I was reading from the uh, Wikipedia, and I don't know if this is true, they did, but they didn't do it correctly. Yeah. Which is the same thing. They like, didn't if you don't do it right. correctly, you still are in the same boat. Yeah. So uh, that's, you know, that's the same way it's in that uh, Night of the Living Dead is in right. uh, the public domain that Ramiro didn't put the right notice on and but there's a difference between Ramiro in his first independent <laughs> right, right. film doing and, it and Universal and Stanley Donnan um, right both not, of whom not yeah, like, I mean, like, Stanley Donnan has a fairly big catalog at this point mm-hmm. in his career yeah and then Universal should know better <laughs> yes Universal as a corporation should know better but at the same time so I mean, it's this is not the only film that that happened on I no, mean, like no, even not. like big films there are movies that are in the public domain for crazy reasons. Yes. So, you know, it happens. <laughs> it's weird, but it, it happens. Does. And I guess it's the better for us because, frankly, it's better that this movie is not copyrighted because anybody can watch it anytime. Yes. Um, yeah, it's actually on IMDb, in fact, <laughs> because it's in the public domain. Um. One thing that did kind of pull me out that I wanted to, I just, I made a note about it. It's not that it really pulled me out, but, um, the scene where they're on the boat, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of good and a lot of bad about it. Like, it's clearly rear projection, but when the rear projection goes under a bridge at one point, they add an echo to the speech. You know, I didn't even notice Um, that. It works really well. Well, I guess that's the thing. If it works really well, that's why I didn't notice, right? Yeah, exactly. If it works really well, then you're not even aware that it, that it could be a problem. Um, where it becomes a problem is the next time they go under a bridge, uh, Cary Grant goes under the bridge, but uh, Audrey Hepburn does not. Huh? Like, I voice swear, or it happened. like in image? No, no, not in voice, in image. Like, behind him, he's very clearly going under a bridge. Uh, behind her, I didn't see a bridge. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> 
but and then like, it cuts back to you him know, and at he the comes same out time, from the though, bridge. Yeah, like I totally agree that that can like be really problematic. But that those rear projection yeah. things are always like that. There's not. I've never yeah, seen a rear think, projection I think, where I was like, "This is not. This is goofy. This is." In stupid. watching it, I think they reused. You know, the scene lasted longer than the rear projection they had, so they reused a little bit. And I think there's one point where they also go under a bridge where the lighting doesn't change. Yeah. Uh, even though all the other times they made a. I mean, a good point of changing the lighting and changing the sound. Obviously, the whole world but, would have been better if they had just been on a boat. Yes. Right. But that's really hard to do. Yeah, boats are hard. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Like, boats I'm looking at the hard. movie poster, and I forgot float. that he takes a shower in his suit. That yes. makes me happy, too. Because yes. <laughs> it's drip dry, yeah. you see. They recommend that he do it uh, <laughs> Yeah, at least once a week or something, I think is what he says. Oh, there's so many yeah. jokes in this movie. But there's so many great jokes, and it's still a really great thriller. And that's that's really where we get. You know, there's uh, there are movies that go for thriller or horror and comedy at the same time, where where it's the disparate is they shoot for it. But there's there's very few movies where it actually works. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's <laughs> and tough, charade is one of man. them. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, oh, I think, yeah, is one of them. Yeah. But um, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is way more intense than this film. It's funny, but well, it's yeah. way... It's well, it was, also, kind of it was also made in the 2000s instead of 1963. Yeah, I, know, so. I mean, I'm just saying in general, like, <clears throat> it's almost a totally different animal. Like, this is more... Yeah. Way more comedy than that one, in a certain way. Because that one is so... Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a different sort of comedy, you know? Like, yeah. You still have the wit, but all the... all A lot of the jokes in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang are delivered as... Um, really antagonistic insults. Yeah, and whereas yeah. most of the jokes in this are not that. In fact, they're, yeah. they're all playful. And that's yes. a big difference. Um, this one, yeah, that, I mean, that's a really tough combination. I guess in a weird way, that kind of puts the lie to the, the best Hitchcock film Alfred Hitchcock never made. No. Because his films are not particularly funny. Well, there's there's moments of humor. I know, but not like this. Humor, but... I mean, this is I mean, this, this is, is the work yeah, of somebody this who is also clearly... does comedy. Yeah, this is a comedy movie. Like his are um, not like there are funny moments. I mean, uh, Lady Vanishes has funny moments in it, but it is not a yeah. comedy. It is a thriller with comedy in it. Sometimes this yeah. is a hybrid of comedy and thriller, like completely. Yeah. And and other movies at the time that were trying that sort of thing, like uh, James Coburn starred in the Flint movies. The Flint movies were more parodic than this. Um, obviously, uh, the original uh, Casino Royale came out around this time, and that is a straight parody. That's not even trying to be a spy right, movie. Right, right. Then, then it's trying to be a parody movie. So, yeah, the, the, the comedic thriller existed at the time, uh, but not... Not in the ways of comedy of this movie. This movie is a pastiche of of Hitchcock, not a parody of it. Right, and I think that's a that's a that's the most important point about it is that like never in the movie no, the movie does not wink at you and say, "Guess what we're doing today? We're gonna yeah. parody Hitchcock." Yeah, it's not like that Mel Brooks movie where they're parodying Hitchcock. That one. It's, oh, it's uh, High Anxiety. Oh, I've never seen that one. I think. Uh, it's a great movie. I saw it on Comedy Central when I was younger. But uh, there's a moment in that movie, like where he's uh, uh, Mel Brooks' character suffers from vertigo, and he's in a car and he's having a spell, and there uh, the music starts getting very dramatically. Oh no! I already like, know something. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then he's in the car and he looks out the window and pulling by is the. Los Angeles Philharmonic yes, of course, of on their course. bus practicing, and that's the that's the music yeah, we're hearing. Yeah, thank yeah. you, thank it's, you so much, Mel Brooks. <laughs> thank you, I Mel love Brooks, him so much. He's yes. my hero. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's interesting in this movie does what it does comedically and and still sells the thriller. You know that third act we're not that, sure. And that's what's going I mean on. that's the most I mean that's what makes it a an incredible film, right? Is the fact that we yeah. I was still in the thriller, despite the fact that it yeah. also made me laugh. Mm -hmm. Which is just really hard to do. I mean, it's just a challenge to, like, you don't see it even now very often. Yeah. So, grand total. Awesome movie. 
Nothing left to talk yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> I guess there is a really no, lot to talk about. No, we are in the same conundrum we always run into. The the good ones are well, the hardest the, ones to talk when about. When there's nothing to complain. Okay, well, let's let's sit and... Let's try to think of a plot hole we can complain um, about. Okay, let's see here. Um, oh, I do. I, I actually okay. have one. Okay, so if uh, the husband, his last meeting was the Thursday prior to buy the stamps at the stamp yes. show. Uh, if those stamps were at the stamp show, why is the other guy, the, the, the stamp collector who buys them from the little boy at the end of the movie, why is he so surprised to have ever, so overjoyed that he might ever encounter these if they were already at the stamp show the last well, week? Well, we know he's coming to the stamp show, but we don't necessarily yeah. know that these were on display at the stamp show. Well, I you mean, saying, our, right? our choice he, is either he bought them there, or he was going to try to sell them there. And if he was going to try to sell them there, then when did he get them and where? Well, okay, but and that, why didn't he sell? That them? is an important point because I really there is a really serious possibility that he was planning to sell them and turn them into cash at the last second. But yeah. if he's buying, but he had, he already had that's the cash. True. He so, had just okay, sold. So he's all not of, trying to do that. You're right. Yeah. So if he's buying yeah. them, but you're probably not going to buy your two hundred fifty thousand dollars stamps. From a booth, you're probably meeting a broker who also runs a booth, and then going up to his yeah, going back to his shop or shop. office or whatever to actually buy maybe. the stamps. Maybe so. I think it's maybe safest I'm just, to assume um, that that is what's going to happen, right? Because we see it with the what Audrey Hepburn's character does. Uh, like that yeah. about booth is closed, and then we go to his place his shop and so yeah. we can assume okay. that this man did the same thing because they're not gonna nobody nobody in the right mind is gonna put two hundred fifty thousand dollars stamps out in a little glass case with with little with like on the streets a, of paris painting, yeah, yeah the streets not. of paris with pain the ass little french kids running around which is my only complaint about the film i hate that child oh yeah I want that, that child, child to, completely to just cease to exist i really like his water pistol though that had really good uh that water pistol had really good pressure yeah, right? Like Yeah. As soon as I met that sure child, that I was like physically. As soon as I met that child, huh. I was like, "Oh god. Why?" I'm just happy that he was not that important to the story. Cuz he yeah. is atrocious. He shows up just enough to yeah. make us hate him. And he, he does He does, you know, it's it's amazing given, you know, that he talked about the stamps. Um that they were, she was going to give him stamps, and you know we get we get a little bit of foreshadowing about the stamps, but it still wasn't until James Coburn and Cary Grant uh, both have that moment. Yeah, of, I had oh, it's the no letter idea that you know I had no no thought that that might be where the money was. Well, that's the beauty of yeah. it. I mean, and that's that, what makes it so. Yeah. That's what makes the story good is that like no one would ever think that the money would be in the stamps. It's just not a thought yeah. that's going to pop into a person's head. Even when the yeah. movie like nudges us and like says, "Hey, yeah. we're talking about stamps an awful lot, aren't we?" And it's, <laughs> you know, it's a hidden in plain sight thing, yeah, and, and that that's a very old story technique. But it's still know. really good. But but it still it, it works really well. Well, here. I mean, that's and the thing: is the hidden in plain sight thing works because it works. You know what I mean? Like it does. It yeah. still exists yeah. because it still works. Yeah, it still happens. Yeah. Um, okay, why, uh, why was he in his pajamas on the train? Um, without any other clothes. Sleeping car. Except for that bag. I don't know, that's a good question. He could have been in his sleep, I'm, I'm fine with him being in a sleeping car, but why didn't he have any other clothes? That's, um, was he really, was he in that Maybe he was just really quick on the run? Ah. Maybe he was, in, yeah, maybe he left in a hurry. I guess so. That works for me. What, do you think that's why he bought the stamps? Was he, in, oh no, he met last Thursday and he leaves on Friday? It would. I would think he leaves after that. Yeah. He certainly didn't. Buy the I was wondering, in his did he buy his someone would have. Someone would have thought about that. I think someone would have noticed a that. A man in pajamas. That would be. A, that would be a hole in the story yeah. if there was some guy walking around the park looking to buy twenty five thousand dollars worth of stamps. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars is pajamas. <laughs> pajamas. You know, this is France, though. Yeah, I do like. I. I really. And it just made me think of it. I really like the police officer and how he looks exactly like the coroner. Like everyone who works for the police department has that same mustache. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's <laughs> really good. Yeah. Well, and then I like how the police officer is like this. Really, like I expected him to be more important, but he yeah. turns out to be borderline irrelevant. Yeah. Like I really yeah. expected him to come 
in at some point in the story and like make some dramatic like make something happen no but he never does he He just shows up to remind us of the body count basically Another and, and to one, look huh? incredulous at everyone, no, and that, but it also leads to one of the greatest lines ever, like about like the pajama killings. Is this a new? Yes. I forget what he says. Like this is a new trend with you Americans. Is it, yes, he warns he warns them not to wear pajamas before he leaves <laughs> yeah, in that scene. Yeah, no, it's, it's, so great. it's great. But yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think there's anything left. No, to, no, I'm satisfied with your answers on my plot yeah, holes. There are, and I don't, I don't think there's anything there, less. I'm than sure that. there are some that we missed, but. Because it's almost impossible to write a thriller without some sort of plot hole. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't hit everything without making it completely ridiculous. <laughs> right, right, like, without uh, making it the, the most convoluted morgue. story the, in history. Yeah, the murder at the room morgue doesn't have any plot holes, but monkeys did it. So, <laughs> right, you know, exactly. You have exactly. your trade off. <laughs> your only option is monkeys did it if you <laughs> want to have it be yeah. flawless. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you once again for listening to Lost in Criterion. This was uh, Stanley Donnan's 1963 charade. Charade. Um, Stanley Donnan makes charade. <laughs> makes a lot of great movies. You should check out this one and uh, be dazzled. Uh, and Singing in the Rain if you haven't. But if you haven't seen Singing in the There's Rain, there's something wrong with you. What probably. Are you? What are you? <laughs> are you human? <laughs> <laughs> Next week we will be talking about the 1960 Michael Powell film Peeping Tom about a peeping Tom. Hmm. So never would have guessed that yes. was the topic. <laughs> I know, right? We'll see you then. Thanks for listening. See you next time. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.